Tony Green. It's always a drawing fiend, I always drew, and drawing is one of the great access portals to higher consciousness. By sitting there calmly, peacefully with a pencil in your hand, you know, observing nature and all its wonderful secrets that it has to offer you. I mean, with patient, careful observation, nature will reveal all her secrets, all the truths. Tony Green, that's actually a really good question because um, I didn't actually meet him. He crashed my wedding in 1983. In fact, he, um, he did almost save my life. So I, I, I started asking around and I started getting bids and uh, Tony came in and truthfully, uh, he gave me the lowest bid. When we finally got away from the cows, Sometimes I think I want to slap him, but you know, then again, I want to hug him. Actually, I could never figure the guy actually doing a job of any sort. Now, he'll get all huffy and say that he works real hard, and I'm sure he does, but, you know, I've never seen him do any real work. Well, people ask me if I grew up in New Orleans, and I always say, not yet. But uh, I grew up on the, not yet, <laughs> on, in Algiers, which is on the other side of the river, what is called the West Bank. I can remember as a kid watching TV, and they say, you know, fighting broke out on the West Bank today. I go, shit, I didn't, I missed all that. <laughs> I was in school. <laughs> anyway, and uh, so my dad was stationed at the Algiers Naval Station in, in Algiers, because he's a Navy man, and that gave us access to the Navy base, so we'd go see all the movies for like a quarter in the swimming pool, and et cetera, et cetera. And, but it was a little house, and there's six of us in this little house. My three brothers, we shared one room. My sister had a room. And then my dad and mom, of course, had their room. And uh, so it was pretty close quarters. And everybody, I guess, to survive had to find their refuge of... So my oldest brother, you know, he was hitting the books all the time. And you know, that was his deal. You know, my sister had her world. Bobby had his. And those guys were older than me. So, um, and I was kind of left behind to do my weirdness. You know, so to get into radical 
leaders and to draw and paint and uh, follow my uh, mentors, which at that time was Salvador Dali, Max Ernst, you know, the surrealists were who I was totally into. educate myself and then to you know put information out whether it's visual information which is enlightening or information about what's going on in the physical world you know just to bring good news to people and it doesn't have to be pretty paintings either it doesn't have to be necessarily happy music some of the most deepest darkest ballads can you know have a lot of healing effect on people I'm, I'm with the Bible that you know says that we're here for the benefit of others you know? and I think once we get on board with that and understand our connection to each other, stop looking at each other and only seeing the differences of you know, race, religion, politics, sex, age, size. <laughs> and, uh, you know, we start having more of a hive mentality, but a good type of hive mentality where we understand our connection to the furthest points in the universe. And we're all connected, all connected, all connected, all connected. All connected. I stumbled into a restaurant on my way. I was hitchhiking from Luxembourg. I just got off an Icelandic flight back in those days. That was the cheapest way to get to Europe. And I was definitely, you know, on a tight budget. So I had my backpack and my tent. You know, I was hitchhiking here, they're sleeping in a field, and da 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 da. And finally, you know, they dropped me in the middle of a Bruges, Belgium. I said, wow, look at this place. You know? Checked it out, was hungry. I walked into this vegetarian restaurant. You know, with my backpack and tent and all that stuff, and um, told them I like to eat, but they said, "Oh no, Gisloten, which is close." Damn, you know. But the girl was kind of cute. You know, we started chatting up each other. She said, "Well, I'll make you something," you know. And, and she brings me a little aperitif, and I said, "I like this," you know. So anyway, make a long story short, then they invited me to stay for dinner and all that, and then I ended up living there for two years. And I was making a living as a portrait artist. I had the worst portraits in Bruges, but they were the cheapest. Okay. So you couldn't go wrong. Tony, like most kids, he was into the rock and roll. He was big into Rolling Stones. Uh, Tony was good about picking out the licks um, off of a record. And one thing I learned from Tony was, uh, you know, when you're picking out the licks, I don't know, do you play guitar at all time? Okay. Yeah. Is with, in, in the old days, with the record, back when we were kids, uh, you had to play it and then take the needle off and back it up to figure out that and then take the needle off and back it up to figure out that and it was an arduous process. And what he figured out to do was pretty good was he slowed the record down to 16 and although it was maybe an octave off or something like that, he could still figure out what the lick was and then you just speed it up. So that was um, a good way that he learned how to play uh, some of the licks from the Rolling Stones and such like that. And then when he went to uh, he was always traveling, and then when he went to Bruges, he got uh, 
hooked on the gypsy jazz stuff. Then I had my band, the rock and roll band, the House Rockers. And uh, so with, uh, being as I was the guy from New Orleans, I was the front guy that sang. So they, a lot of people thought it was an American band, you know. So I told the other guys, shut up, you know, let me talk. You know, I think we're all Americans. You know, give us a little more cachet. And, uh, but then I got introduced to the Gypsy Jazz, stumbling into a place called the Cactus Restaurant one night. My buddies told me there's this Gypsy band playing. You need to go check these guys out. So I did, and uh, I was immediately taken with the, the impact of their virtuosity and the passion and the precision, the musicality, the romance. It was all there in this package of this great European music. A quartet with Kuhn de Couture on horns, who also a fabulous guitar player, complete musician. Papi Lafertine, the soloist, his cousin Vivi Limberger on rhythm guitar, and Michel Vestraud on upright bass. And these guys just knocked my socks off. And at that point, I immediately became a gypsy jazz groupie. And I just followed these guys around my tape recorder, taping them, you know, listening to the tapes and learning as much as I can. And uh, it just opened up a whole uh, new horizon because I was from New Orleans, totally into the black funk thing and the rhythm and blues and all that. And then I realized, wow, I have a heritage too. You know, my European heritage, beautiful melodic music. And I think I'll investigate that. And, you know, I haven't looked back since. tennis shoes, shorts, t-shirt, that was it. We were wondering why all these people had ropes and, you know, hooks and, and like all this safety equipment. And um, anyway, so we kept going higher and higher and we were in the glaciers. And there were all these ladders, these iron ladders that were on the, um, it was like a, a nipple of the mountainside coming out. And the ladders would go around these, uh, you know, obtrusions, um, obstacles, and um, and so you'd get on them, and you were supposed to link your rope and and you know your safety gadgets on them to climb up these ladders. Well, we didn't do that. Well, Tony went up and got up onto the ledge and was fine. But as I was starting to go up there, my rucksack was pulling me back, and I looked down, and I got the heebie-jeebies, you know, height. And my knees started to tremble and my hands were sweating and I was holding on to this iron rung of this ladder knowing I was slipping. I just always remember we had this wonderful hike up to the top of the mountain and uh, and then and, and we were standing up there, and there was actually this you know big, one of those big uh, mountain stags, or you know what are they called the uh, the ones with the amazing horns, you know. And it was actually up on the up on this up on this uh, big rock, kind of posing, you know. And we got up, you know, and we're standing up there, and it's silent and it's beautiful. And uh, this friend of ours, the uh, the Venetian um, musician, his cell phone rang, you know, right at the moment we were at the top of this mountain, and. Uh, I just remember telling you a really hard time about answering the cell phone. <laughs> settle down do you think do you think you'll ever find somebody and settle down he said you know he said I'd like to he said I've tasted a lot of icing but I've never found the cake I said oh my goodness I had this idea about doing murals and I started asking questions and I, and I wanted to do a neighborhood scene and I, I wanted to do something with a ball uh, the ballpark related to the ballpark 
he put together a few things, uh, some ideas, and he came to me. And the first time he, 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 he drew something, uh, it came up, and it had a lot of ornate, kind of like Mardi Gras Indians. And I said, no, man, that's, that's, that's not really what I'm looking for. I'm really looking for a neighborhood scene, and kind of a neighborhood bar scene. So uh, he came back and essentially pretty much had drawn up what this mural kind of looks like. I said, man, that's exactly, I said, man, if you could put that on a wall, that would be, that's what I want. And uh, he said, I think I can do it. Well, he did it, and it was just, you know, a masterpiece. I still think it's a masterpiece. When he was in school, yeah, in particular high school, you know, normally if you're going to do well in school, you get your notebook, and you take good notes, and you study the note. But if you look at his notes, notebooks, it was really incredible to see some of the notebooks that he had. had virtually no notes, but just these really nice drawings on all the pages, and some of them were, were pretty surreal, and uh, all of them very good. So if you just thumb through his um, notebooks from high school, you'll find some really, really cool stuff in there. Well, I met this guy who lived out in the country, too, from Washington, D.C., David Logston, and um, we conspired to, to make our own fig wine, and the fig wine was such a success that we both hitchhiked up to... Uh, Washington, D.C. <laughs> it's wild, man. And uh, so we get there, we stayed at his mom's house, and he said, you know, I should enroll in the Corcoran School of Art. So I did. And the Corcoran School of Art is located right next to the executive building. You have the White House, the executive building, and there's the Corcoran School of Art. This wonderful Victorian marble, resplendent architectural, you know, gem. And I thought, oh, finally. This is where I'm going to get the fundamental education I've been striving for. Learning about anatomy, how to draw, composition, color theory, it's all here. Obviously, look at this building. Wrong. I get stuck with this guy, Gene Davis. Okay, Gene Davis, you know. And this is in the 70s, you know, when the abstract expressionist thing was, was just taken over everything. And they poo-pooed anything that even smelt of academic knowledge, you know. And then one day I was riding my bike down Magazine Street in New Orleans. I'm back here and I look at, and I say, New Orleans Academy of Fine Arts. Are you kidding me? So I went in, you know, checking it out. I met the director, this guy called Ozaklis Ozols, who's a Latvian um, immigrant. He came when he was about 12 years old, settled in Philadelphia with his parents, an exceptional artist, a very talented man very knowledgeable, a direct link to the Renaissance, because he studied with people who studied with people who studied with people. So, you know, and I met him and I said, isn't this ironic that I meet the guy, as I've been all over looking to really study in Washington and Belgium, and here's the guy right here in my backyard. So, I immediately started studying with him, and I would do six months studying with Ozaklis, and I'd go back and do six months living in Venice and do six months with Osglis, six months in Venice. Putting what I'd learned, the theories and, and techniques that he taught me into practice in the real field, doing landscape paintings and still lives and figure studies, and that was a great way to build up my, um, you know, my technique, etc. And I'd come back, bring a body of work, and have an exhibition here in New Orleans, and that's pretty much how I always took care of myself.
We had a reception at the Columns, and Beausoleil was playing. I'd never met Tony, and uh, he showed up in pictures of the video. Uh, not the video, but still pictures. And we were asking at the time, who's that guy in painter's overalls and stuff? Well, he heard the band, saw the free food, so he crashed it. I told him, I'm slipping. Well, he came partway down to try to grab me, but he couldn't reach around this, this um, you know, the lump of the mountain to grab me. So he said, he, he, as Tony does, started to talk me through something and, and get me distracted so that I wouldn't think about what, you know, what I was doing. And um, he said, just focus, what's in front of you? What is in front of you? And there was this little flower. And I said, it's a little flower. And he said, what color is it? Tell me about it, explain it, you know. And so I started talking about the flower and I started to calm down. And then he said, just put one hand up and climb up the next one. And I climbed up the next one. And with that, he grabbed my rucksack and he yanked me around this and we stood on that ledge trembling for a while there. On the keyboard, I did want to play uh, a piece uh, that I put out on a CD. I actually wrote a piece for Tony. Uh, this piece is called Antonio Verde, which is the Italian translation of Tony Green. And uh, it's a minor mode waltz, similar to the Eastern European things that Tony likes so much and, and that he plays as well. Anyway, let's see. It's my pleasure to introduce a real artist, musician, and uh, someone with a lot of talent. Uh, Tony Green joining us right here on the uh, Ringside program. And Tony, welcome. Thank you, Jeff. Thanks for having me on your program. Oh, it's my pleasure. Uh, tell us a little bit about uh, what initially attracted you to music. Uh, how long have you been making music? Oh, uh, at least 40 years. At least 40 years. And uh, as a kid, uh, my, I have two older brothers, and uh, they were into blues, etc. And so they introduced me to the world of blues through. Uh, Various of their friends were record collectors, etc. So I got hip to the New Orleans of the blues and uh, etc. And that sort of led me as I continued my uh, journey in life to Europe, where I discovered something called gypsy jazz. And that's really uh, what you're known for, right? The gypsy jazz, right? Yeah, yeah. Gypsy jazz is is a term that was coined during the the era of uh, in France during the 30s and the 40s. And the great mentor is a guy called Django Reinhardt. And Django exposed me to the beauties of the European melodic music, of the Hungarian Sardish, uh, the Italian Tarantellas, the Fado music of uh, Portugal, the French Valse Musette. I mean, it's just such a wealth of music. And 
you know, and me getting in touch with my European heritage too, which is important. We were talking off air that uh, you were born in Naples, Italy, right? Yes, yes. And raised in Algiers. Yes, and I think conceived in Venice. So there we go, <laughs> full circle. <laughs> and, uh, and what's interesting about you is you live part of the year here, yeah. part of the year in, in Venice, right? Mm -hmm. Through tomorrow night, uh, your artwork is going to be displayed, correct? Yes, I've had an exhibition at the Academy Gallery. I'm, I'm normally represented by Cal and Fine Art, but they very kindly let me have this special show at the Academy Gallery at the 5256 Magazine Street. Um, and it is a show that had paintings of Venice, paintings of New Orleans, and paintings of something called the New World Order. I don't know if we're allowed to talk about that here. Let's segue right into that. You've been doing a lot of uh, research into that, haven't you? I have indeed. I have indeed. I've always been, you know, had my antennas out. I've been a truth seeker. And being an artist, I have lots of time for research and to, to see what's going on behind the scenes. And since uh, it started with Kennedy being shot, I didn't believe that story. And then, you know, why we got into Vietnam and uh, leading up to 911, which after I did the research on that, that, that stunk to high heaven. And then Katrina, the post New Orleans Katrina about FEMA, you know, their involvement with uh, not allowing supplies to come in, cutting power lines to create somewhat of a laboratory here for the coming martial law that most Americans don't know that we're already in. It's just not hot martial law. Yeah. And with the new administration, is this sort of uh, same sort of control continuing? New bus driver, same bus. Mm -hmm. New bus driver, same bus. In fact, this bus driver, he looks so much better. He talks so much better. Oh, he's so wonderful. Love fest. But uh, you're going to find that he's going to be the guy that we're going to hate the most because they're just going to use him as a scapegoat for when all the stuff really starts to come down. He'll be the, the birdcage liner that will be pulled out and they'll put in a Republican one four years after him. Before that, he really wasn't particularly concerned um, politically. His, you know, he, most, most of his interests had more to do with art and music. Uh, God bless him and his thoughts. Just keep them to yourself because personally, I don't want to hear him. And I don't think most people want to hear him unless they're in that same tune. He's constantly emailing people about his views and there's no changing him sometimes. As, since he's been in Europe, he, um, his values are totally different than ours are over here and he doesn't quite understand what we are going through. He sees it his way and sometimes there's no changing Tony. You know, I, I just appreciate his his passion for everything, you know. I find find it in his politics these days, you know, fairly overbearing. But um, I do uh, appreciate the way he he goes with gusto after you know art and and music. I mean, he's a he's a true seeker of what he thinks is beautiful. This is Patriot Radio. Radio Free Florida Lee, your shining light of truth in the Crescent City. We have with us today Tony Green, an internationally known artist and musician. He's going to give us the lowdown on his awakening and becoming aware of the New World Order. He does artwork on the New World Order, Kim Trails, and other things like that. He just explained it to me, and he can explain it better than I can, so I'm going to let him talk to you. Thank you so much for letting me come on your Patriot radio station. This is a very important tool to waking up the public because we're fighting a media that is completely controlled and the whole purpose is about dumbing down the population. So I'm very happy to be here. Why am I talking about this stuff? Because I care about humanity. I found out so much. It all started with 911. At first, I was a lot more comfortable when you know, I thought it was you know the Islamic Jihad and a couple of guys in caves orchestrating the demolition of the three buildings, building one, two, and number seven, I have a choice. I can be a slave and I can just take the official story and walk away and go back to sleep, or I can start acting like a citizen and do what the journalists are supposed to do but don't do, and that is ask questions and demand answers. I have the luxury of living also abroad. The citizens there have access to information. There was a two-hour program on Italian national television that spoke about 911 being an inside job. You know, simple facts like you know the temperature it takes for steel to melt versus the temperature of a jet fuel in a building. And jet fuel is made up of 80 percent kerosene, and I believe the temperature is about 1,200 degrees. And the, the, the 
melting rate of uh, steel is, what is it, 2,000 something? I mean, you can look this up right now on Google and Google up, you know, what the temperature was. It was impossible for those buildings to come down. And then there's building seven that wasn't even touched by a plane. Okay, that's on national TV. And with this, they, the citizens can come to their own conclusions by getting all the information and exercising something called analytical thinking, which is they, what they are not teaching our children to do today. Today it's all about being a repeater, the one who repeats the most, advances, and you, you get to the point where you become a zombie and you just take the information, go with that, and don't question anything. You know, I know everybody out there knows something's wrong, but you, don't, you feel it in your gut, but you can't really figure out what it is because you don't go and do the research. I just say to you, whatever I say, whatever Gary says, don't believe a word of it, folks. Don't believe any of this. But we challenge you to go out and do your research and prove us wrong, okay? Go do your research, come to your own conclusions. But as far as informing people, this is an information war. And you're not going to hear about it on any of the television stations. The internet is the last bastion of truth. And they're in the process of closing that down. If you do your research and you work your way up the pyramid, you're going to find out there's maybe about 300, 400 people who control what's going on in this world, okay? And the only reason they're getting away with that is because we let them get away with it. So once we wake up and find out that this is an attack against Humanity, when you go down the rabbit hole of information and get to the bottom of it, you're going to find out something called eugenics. Okay, Look, Google that up, eugenics, all right? And find out how Bill Gates and Melinda Gates are involved in this. Find out how Ted Turner is involved in this. You know, find out how the Nazis use eugenics. That was their little laboratory. And folks, the Nazis didn't lose. They merely relocated, okay? It's hard to see the Illuminati. It's kind of hard to see the New World Order. It's a little difficult to see a Rothschild, but damn it, there's a chemtrail right in front of you, and there's so many people that will not even see it. They will refuse to even look up at the sky, and it's so obvious that it's right there in your face, and they still don't see it. Have you come across that? Well, of course, you know, and it's really tough for people to wrap their mind around this stuff. I mean, it's a dismantling of an entire belief system. But folks, the big picture is this. If you can begin to dismantle that belief system and find out and discover how, why, and by who you're being manipulated, then you can step away from the manipulation and you make a step closer to something called self-actualization where you discover who you really are, and that's what this century is all about. It's about humanity evolving to the next level. It's our time. But, you know, Gary, I want to clarify one thing, and that is I am not an expert, okay? I'm not a scientist, okay? I'm not a geologist, you know? I'm, I'm, not, a, I'm not a political expert. I am a citizen, okay? I am a citizen that decided not to be a slave. I'm a citizen that decided to go and start doing my homework. I'm a citizen that decided that why don't I read up on this stuff? Why don't I find out what the Constitution is? Why don't I find out what the Bill of Rights is? Why don't I find out what world history is all about? I had to re-educate myself, and I'm in the process now. I'm a work in progress. And that's what everybody else, I suggest. You know, turn off that television, folks. Please, please, for your own sake. I'm, <laughs> you know. It was spot on. Uh, as far as my political leanings, some of the things that I've come to believe, uh, different truths, 9-11 um, is an inside job, um, good grief. What are we doing here? Oh, uh, well the View Carre Commission, which is the uh, aesthetic police of the French Quarter, decided that my Ron Paul sign, which I made myself, was a grassroots passion of when Ron Paul was running for president. Remember him, the guy that was censored in the Republican uh, uh, presidential uh, debates? Debates. <laughs> oh, man. And so they pretty much demonized him and, you know, kept the sheeple out of the, the light of what, you know, this man was talking about, the Constitution. You know, liberty, freedom, our Bill of Rights, you know, the false terrorist acts that were going on in America. You know, how our, our government has been pretty much hijacked. Well, I feel um, that uh, uh, 
there's more than one role of the artist. Um, I'm a performer, I'm a serious musician, I love to be appreciated for my music, but I also, at this point in my life, really believe that I want people to be entertained. And entertainment or um, have some reason to come there. Uh, politics are okay. His, the music he plays is specifically non-political. He has no songs. There's no other reason for people to come for him politically. So I think from you know my point of view, it doesn't fit with what he's presenting musically. Um, I think it fits more in, in terms of art and in terms of emails and things like that. And I don't think you should avoid it, but I think people are coming there to enjoy it. And, and Tony has a long history of, of disregarding his audience, of treating his, his audience um, with disdain because they don't know Django or because somebody's talking or somebody's dancing, you know? And um, I love a listening audience, but I don't think you should ever insult the people you're playing for. They've come to see you. I'm gonna do this next tune. We'd like to send it out to um, a guy called George Bush Jr. A little tune called September Song. I, I think Tony's a genius when it comes to music and art, and I'd put him uh, in there with Lil Murphy Hines as far as political science. Because <laughs> I have a, a very good friend of mine who's a priest. Um, who actually went over to Venice last year, um, met with Tony, with, he was on sabbatical in Rome, and he had a, several priests who, you know, were in Rome that he'd met, and he called Tony up, and, and Tony said, sure, let's go out and have dinner. And um, Tony was telling me this story on the phone, and I said, well, did you behave? He said, I actually did. He said, but if I'd known then about, you know, how involved the Catholic Church was, you know, I, I wouldn't keep my mouth shut. It's, it's the conspiracy. I mean, that it's involved the same as, you know, the Queen of England. He's told me that too, you know, several times, the royal family, and how, you know, it goes back, you know, for um, thousands of years, and, you know, so, I don't know. I'm not interested in it, I'm afraid. <laughs> so. uh, it was interesting. Uh, I, I met him with a mutual friend of ours uh, at a Cafe Envy in the French Quarter here in New Orleans. And uh, I, I'd never met him before. I didn't know anything about him. Uh, I didn't know he was an artist. I didn't know he was a musician. I knew he was a good friend of my buddies. And uh, we got, to got, got together, had a little powwow with coffee, and just talked about some of the things that we're having to deal with. Um, from the lies in the mainstream media about our economy, uh, about the sustained chemical attack by the people who are supposed to be looking out for our best interests, um, geopolitics, all of that. Uh, he seemed like a really bright guy. Um, and it seemed like uh, pretty much we get our information from similar sources. Okay, this one is uh, another David D's composition. You know, brilliant David D's. And, uh, this one speaks for itself, the deliberate dumbing down of America, okay, and what they do, they want to get the kids at an early age. So they get them hooked on these psychotropic drugs here, okay, to bring them down, to take away all their childhood tendencies, you know, as they become enamored with life and excited and all the enthusiasm of running around. Oh, no, we can't have that. We can't have that because we must control them at an early age. And we teach them to be repeaters, repeaters. So the ones that repeat the best advance to the next level. And then let's just talk about cell phones, all right? Cell phone technology is the weapon of the new world order, okay? Have you noticed how children become, especially in Italy, it's incredible. They are just completely a slave to their cell phone. Their whole life revolves around the cell phone. So you will see people never in the moment Never aware of the beautiful day, never aware of the life that's all around it that's happening in this moment right now. It takes you out of the moment because you're always concerned about what's going to happen on your little cell phone and you can't wait to get home so you can get on Facebook because I have 800 friends on Facebook, woohoo, even though I'm ugly and I'm a complete personality disordered person, you know, complete jerk, but I got 800 friends. So this whole virtual world of interacting with people when in fact you're not interacting at all, right? 
And um, but the um, the cell towers, etc., do a lot. These kids are very young, so what happens? Their brains are much more impressionable, much more vulnerable to the. Uh, the microwaves of these cell phones. So there's going to be a huge outbreak of uh, brain cancer coming up, and it's all part of the soft kill. All right, the soft kill that is brought to you by fluoride, that's brought to you by chemtrails, that's brought to you by genetically modified foods, brought to you by cell phones, and who knows what else. So that whole grid system, you must wake up to the grid system that you're in. You know, think of your families, think of the future of humanity, step back from the grid system, and we must come up with a way to defeat this, okay? And we will. We will. You know, if you go to the supermarket and you look and every single stick of gum has aspartame in it. You go to GNC and you look at the protein shakes. They all are sweetened with aspartame. Aspartame, aspartame, aspartame. Never mind the fact that the stuff is toxic. It's poison. But they approved it and now they put it in everything. One, two, one, two, three. Documentary on me. You want to be in the documentary? Oh, I love it. This is French Quarter Mom. <laughs> I love any details and the beauty of that whole type of mind control is that the public transmits what their desires are what they want they put it on the blank canvas and that's what Obama is and they're playing us like like violins driving us like cars they want us to turn left, we turn left. They want us to turn right, we turn right. They want us to go straight, we go straight. They want us to stop, we stop. You really don't want to hear that. You don't want to be inundated with your email or that stuff. And Sorry, Tony, we've already had this uh, disagreement also about this. Why hasn't anybody made a, a real, you know, why haven't we seen any Hollywood movies about the New World Order? But we have, but they, what they do, they trivialize these things. And they turn it into something silly, like there was a, you know, what's his name, Harry Shearer did a film back in the 80s about Bohemian Grove and made it into sort of a silly thing so he, you lose the true potency and importance of, of what that group is all about. Lately we've been scuffling over politics but 
I have really just tried to avoid it for the most part. The, the, the whole reoccurring theme in all this is you do the research going to the top of the pyramid of these organizations, you find they are all occultists. They're all occultists. And that's, that's the terrifying part. Because they deeply believe in blood sacrifice, the sacrifice of children, which translates to virgins. When you have the sacrifice of the virgins, that's well, really the sacrifice of children. I know several people that have sent them emails, please don't send me any more of this stuff. And uh, I don't open them all, I don't really open a lot of attachments, I can barely keep up with my email. But I know, to me, some of it seems pretty far-fetched. So much of this, this, this um, culture of death now, that's because the occult people are now moving in. They, they've saturated our culture with this culture of death. Harry Potter films, okay? I love those films, oh, they're great, really well made. Great budgets, you know, good acting in the English tradition, you know. Special effects, extraordinary, you know. But on closer look, they're all about conditioning children and, and uh, bringing them into this whole world of the occult. With the books, you know, it was so great to see kids, oh look, he's reading, he's not watching TV, but he's reading the Harry Potter book. You know, it, 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 it's only been through emails, Primarily, but uh, you know, t Tony seems to think that the, uh, the the federal government, George Bush, Dick Cheney, orchestrated the the planes flying into the twin towers, and I just think that's totally absurd. Can I remind you about an exhibition I have right now? Yeah. Is that all right? You know, self-promotion, this is the only way I can tell you about this, but I have an exhibit at the Academy Gallery. Do you know what that is? No. Yes, no. And it's up on Magazine Street. Do you know what that is? Yes. So, 5250, it's where the New Orleans Academy of Fine Arts is. Okay. So we'll be having, uh, exhibiting my painting, some of it of New Orleans, some of it of Venice, not Louisiana, but Italy. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> And then something else called the New World Order. Who knows what that is? <laughs> Yay! Okay, good. For the rest of you, go home and Google up New World Order, okay? You're going to find out all kinds of stuff you never knew about. Tony is, uh, Tony is... I think Tony, uh, who's a very interesting person to talk to in every respect and he's a great listener you know he he's very opinionated which I like but he talks when you talk to Tony you get a response he listens to what you said and he responds to it not many people do that Tony uh, uh, he encouraged me as Tony always does Tony is the biggest encourager to anybody uh, with whatever talents that they have that he will push them and try and get them to where he feels you know would be a good point for them to either start doing something or, you know, to, to try and further their experiences. He's a great teacher. Once you become conscious of the truth, then you become conscious of the lies. You begin to see the lies very clearly also. And when you start to see lies, then you become a very dangerous individual. Because, you know, you have a, a certain level of e illumination which you can share with your fellow human being and uh, can lead to some very interesting results, can lead to things like freedom and liberty. You know, it could lead to the end of tyranny, you know? It could lead to the freeing of your mind so that your creative soul can soar, no matter what 
you know, profession you're in. Because I know a lot of artists, I know a lot of musicians who are not artists, who are not musicians, okay, are not creative at all. They could even be very good technicians, but they have nothing to say. Well, folks, thanks again for being such an intelligent audience. And let's thank all of our wonderful dancers here. To the rest of the world out there listening, God bless you. We love this planet and we love everybody on it. Let's take care of each other, all right? Rick Olivares on the guitar. Steve Braun on the bass. Tony Green on the guitar. Grab your coat and grab your hat. Leave your worries on your doorstep. Just direct your feet to that sunny side of the street. Can't you hear that pit up? Baby, that's your big fat feet doing all of that. Life can seem so sweet on the sunny side of the street. I used to walk in the shade. With my blues on parade Baby, I'm not afraid Because with Rover, I done crossed over If I never, ever, ever have a sin Or oh, I'll be rich as that scumbag David Rockefeller Go lost round my feet On the sunny side of the street Oh yeah, on the sunny side of the street Oh yeah, on the sunny